We're all super excited to have this fabulous panel here tonight to talk about their films that are nominated for the Spirit Award and um, also to give us insights on their how they cast, how they are artists and freelancers similar to us and to give you all kinds of great information. So what we're going to do is go ahead and start. And Paul, if you wouldn't mind, just Hi. introduce yourself and um, talk about the films that are nominated. Sure. Uh, my name is Paul Shea. I'm a freelance casting director. I have a uh, business partner I work with named Carrie Barden, who is a male, for those of you writing letters. Um, he's in <laughs> uh, we have an office in, Cal in L.A. where he's based. And for the Spirit Awards this year, we are, well, not we, Paul Dano is nominated I think for best lead, I'm not sure which, for Love and Mercy and Weir and Mark Ruffalo and Rachel and Tom McCarthy and Tom and Josh Singer for Spotlight and we're also getting the Robert Altman Award for Ensemble for Spotlight. Congratulations. Liz? Hi. So the film that um, our office, well not our office, but our office cast is Advantageous, Hi, Liz Ortiz Mackis and I love that this film was nominated for the Cassavetes Award. And for those of you that don't know what that category means, it means a film with the budget of an expired Metro card and you can't get on the bus from the train. <laughs> uh, so it's for uh, excellent filmmaking for a budget of under, I believe, 200 and uh, 250,000. SAG Ultra Low Budget Agreement was the agreement that we worked on. And the film was made for under 200. And uh, I love that it was nominated for the Cassavetes Award because I actually identify more as an indie film producer. I was a co-producer and uh, did the casting that was required once the project came to me, which I'll get into a little bit uh, later. So I think it's absolutely appropriate that it's nominated in that category because overall it has uh, excelled in so many areas, not just the casting, but certainly um, casting was very critical. Wonderful. Lois? Oh, yes, please. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Lois Drapkin, and the film that I was nominated is Glass Chin and the actress Marin Ireland for her supporting role in that. And she's a wonderful New York actress, theater actress, and does film and t television as well. And she's so fantastic and has such a range. And this director, No Bouchelle, uh, I've worked with him on several of his films. And it's one of those rare connections with a casting director and a director where you just have the you know, in intuitive and instinctive connection on actors you like and that you can see in roles and envision in roles. And Noah and I had that right away on his first film, Neil Cassidy, that I worked on. And then, uh, and that's progressed through several of his films until Glass Chin. And we did use a lot of New York theater actors, so that was exciting. And, um, and so, so Marin is getting some wonderful recognition for this, which she duly deserves. <laughs> Thank you, Lois. Okay, so let's kind of jump in with the nuts and bolts here. Um, let's talk about these projects that you're nominated for and um, where you got involved in the process of it and maybe what drew you to the actual, to the film. Paul, do you want to start? Yeah, why not? Well, with Spotlight, I mean, we, Carrie and I have worked on all of Tom's movies since, well, since uh, The Station Agent, although I wasn't casting that. So it was sort of a Fort Vaughn conclusion. It started like with you and Noah. You know, we were going to do it. I can't remember exactly when he sent us the script. I know it was before he made The Cobbler, um, which is the film he made right before Spotlight. So it's at least like four years ago, I think. And then it kind of went away, and then he did The Cobbler, in which we also cast, and then Spotlight came back. And it, it did kind of take on a life of its own in terms of... Um, you know, anonymous content was already producing, and Nicole and Bla uh, Nicole Rockland and Bly Faust were producing, and they're pretty. I mean, is indie in spirit more than budget? I think the budget was like twenty or more. So, you know, what's indie? I guess. I, so, um, we started working on it in earnest. I guess about three years ago, when he was finishing post production on Spotlight, and you know how a lot of these things work when they want certain or they want names in certain roles. We were lucky in that. It is an ensemble movie. Mark 
Ruffalo was the first one in, and he started champion, championing in the film amongst other actors. It, it sort of got going of its own speed. Um, we oversaw the casting in Boston and Toronto um, to give it, you know, more of that authentic feel for some of the more ensemble parts, and it just it turned out. It turned out well. <laughs> and I'm not sure that answers your question. Yeah, well, that that's that's <laughs> wonderful. Um, also, when so when you have this long-term relationship with with the director, then when you get the script, mm -hmm. do you start seeing people that you know already that you've met in, or worked with in the past, and you start envisioning them in those roles while you're reading that script for the first time? Yeah, yeah, totally. And I, I think in this case, it was there was already, we knew sort of a mandate of like, look, they would love to have, you know, well-known actors, movie stars for these, you know, four roles or whatever. So you kind of, you start thinking, and then for some of the more supporting roles, it was like, oh, I really want to introduce Tom to, you know, Michael Cyril Creighton, for example, who plays Joe Crowley, one of the survivors, and some of the guys in Boston. That's, in this, in the case of this movie, that's where that thinking came in, because Tom, luckily, for, well, you know, for him and for, for me, he's at a point now and has gotten there where with The Visitor, let's say, with, which was the movie with Richard Jenkins and um, Haas Slayman and Denai Grier. It was like, Denai hadn't been on The Walking Dead yet. You know, we already knew who she was from New York theater. There was a little more room, because it was a smaller movie, to introduce Tom and then audiences to actors they might not know. Where Spotlight, you know, there just isn't that room, because the mandate's different in terms of the, the names that they want or need. Sure. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. Well, this is so interesting how the process happens because, um, you know, so often you'll go to a film festival or you'll turn on your, you know, TV or get your screener for a movie, you know, as we go into like the SAG Awards. And, you know, this is what we're finding out is like what's happening way before any of that happens. And this is a process that's going on all the time for you guys. And that should be hopefully going on for, for all actors as well, you know, being involved, getting, getting involved in something um, early on. So this is, this is great information. So thank you. Anything else about it that no, you want to say? You know, the can in terms of what you, your question about, actors coming into your head. I mean, the canvas is different. When we knew, in the case of Spotlight, that for those, you know, four roles or so, for those of you who've seen it, I was thinking of a certain, you know, 25 or so namey guys for those roles. And, you know, for the one, the role that Rachel McAdams plays, like, you know, thinking of like 25 women. Whereas on something like The Visitor, I'm thinking at a, at a less well-known level, you know, of like the solid working New York actors that you want to introduce into that film. So it's just like, Yes, you're thinking of actors, specific actors for those roles, but the pool that you're drawing from in your head changes depending on the budget and the needs of the, of the producers and that sort of thing. Awesome. Thank you. I Liz. am so glad I'm going after him because, <laughs> because so much is so parallel, except in the case of Advantageous. Everything he said, but at the micro-budget level. So what was very interesting about Advantageous, and I don't think uh, a film before or after will kind of have this quite of a quilt, crazy quilt um, backstory. So I was first, um, I first became familiar with the, the project when it was a short that was commissioned by, I believe it was a PBS uh, program called Future States, right? And m most of the cast was in place for the short, and I was approached, because I had a really great relationship with the producer, who is also a very talented director, who I call myself his casting wife. Anything he's ever done, we've had a bunch of films at Sundance over the years, um, we, we're, we just collaborate. So he was hired as a producer and brought me in to cast uh, one role for the, sh for the short. and. Um, because of crazy logistics, et cetera, another casting director cast this uh, one role. I don't know what happened with the casting situation, but when this was going to be, uh, turn or evolve into a feature, um, I was delighted that I was asked vehemently, uh, we really want you to, to cast the feature. Another unique thing about this was, or what really makes it unique was because of the micro-budget nature of Advantageous, and Jennifer Fong, P-H-A-N-G, um, she's a genius, and the caveat, in addition to the 100 caveats that I'm gonna get into in a second, but the main caveat was 
they were going to shoot around this short that was over two years old. So we had a cast around that, so bring back some people that were already in place, bring in some more. And when I read the script, I was just thrilled because uh, it was such compelling um, screenwriting. It's science fiction for smart people. It's on Netflix, please see it. And it's, it's getting a lot of attention. She's getting the attention she deserves. So an early phone call was, okay, we're ready to do the feature. We want you to cast 40 roles. I got so excited because I knew for the supporting roles, some of the minor roles, day player roles, I can, you know, I can dive into this fabulous talent pool, my New York people, and I can get all multi on it and really just work it, and that's my thing. And I'm not a fan of the word diversity, I'm a fan of the word inclusion, yeah. right? Hello. Yeah. So, thank you. So, I don't know what happened with the money, because what, there wasn't a lot of money, so we went from 40 actors, and I was just so thrilled. I get the phone call, okay, we're gonna go from 40 actors to nine actors. I'm like, they're gonna freestyle this movie, but whatever. So, script change, and some more attachments came in. So, uh, Jennifer's represented by ICM because of her first feature that was in Sundance in 2008 called Half Life. And this woman is like a modern day pinter on crack. She's just brilliant. And uh, that's how she got ICM. And from ICM, they affiliated with CAA and they got the wonderful Ken Jeong to uh, play a supporting role. He fell so in love with the project, he became a producer on it. And uh, he really is Dr. Ken. On set, uh, the kid playing uh, his son, uh, a piece of equipment, uh, I think the wind, it was an exterior shot, fell on his head. Dr. Ken took care of it because he's a real doctor. Thank God. And the kid and the parents were so thrilled like we didn't get in trouble <laughs> because it was Dr. Ken. <laughs> so um, we had uh, mandates, as Paul had said. So I had to work around the attached uh, so, you know, celebrity, well-known actors, and then fill in the blanks, plus work around for continuity with what they were editing from the original short. Samantha Kim is a young teenage actress who is the second lead, and thank God she didn't break out into puberty until after they wrapped the feature, which was <laughs> shocking. So this is another example of the crazy quilt and the, and the backstory. I think many actors would think, okay, from soup to nuts, from A to Z, we're casting every single role. And as Paul said so uh, perfectly, there are mandates and conditions that change constantly. So that's sort of the backstory in a nutshell. Thanks, Liz. That's so interesting, too, because it really draws on your patience <laughs> and also your creativity to be able to, you know, pull um, people that you know now who could fit into things and also having to take somebody that you have to match up in a family situation, which I don't think is ever really easy to do, you know, to be able to match to make something believable, but then to have all those other hurdles that you had to you know, go over. And I, is it because when you read that script that you, you really said, I'm passionate about this, this needs to be done? Because it also, for, for a small budget, I mean, it's very interesting since it has the sci-fi aspect, which you don't think normally can go together like that, but it, it works beautifully. I mean, it, as a film, it, it's very, very interesting and amazing concept. So it is on Netflix if you want to check it out. But do you feel like that was because you were so into it that that sort of helped you get through all those different um, barriers that came up? I think because of the history that I had with the producer who's a director in his own right that I have a lot of uh, over 10 years history with and also being a fan of Jennifer's work and just sort of trusting her genius and not questioning too much and what was going on too at the same time, we were having sessions for roles that were filled by more well-known actors just in case, because again, the budget was non-existent practically. So I was doing sessions for roles, and that I thought at the time, some things were not disclosed to me, which I don't, I'm not making them wrong for that. I think that's actually very good business 
I don't need that filtered in the back of my mind, well, I'm just doing this, but it's kind of precast already. I went in full steam ahead um, under the impression that these roles needed to be filled in their mind from the executive producer, who I really wasn't interfacing with. I was interfacing more with the line producer, right? Um, that they had me do my job and to cover these roles with brilliant actors, like our fabulous uh, New York film and, TV, film and stage and TV actors that we love to pull from, not knowing that those deals were going to be uh, finalized with the more known actors. So I was doing lots of casting, thinking that it was for uh, a different number of roles that the finished product, but you know what, at the end of the day, all I have control of is knowing who to pull from and to, to do my job uh, to the client specifications, even though that's gonna change like every 10 minutes. <laughs> but that's how it is. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. And Lois, for you, do you wanna talk about Glass Chin, how that happened, how you got involved in it? Sure, yeah. So as I mentioned earlier, Noah and I had worked on a couple films together, so this was his third feature, and we had a shorthand, so if I make a list for him and we talk about actors or and I show him some reels, then you know he he's we have such a connection that he trusted my suggestions. So so there wasn't a lot of auditioning for for this film, but um, we initially I was on as a producer for the film, but we couldn't quite find the financing for it. He wanted to make it for about three million initially. Um, and he subsequently did a smaller film with some producers out in LA that starred Marin and Paul Sparks. Um, and those produ that they had a good experience on that. So those producers came on board Glass Chin and they were able to find the financing for that. And what was great about it is we didn't have too many mandates. So, um, I didn't necessarily have to get the A-list actor for the lead role, which which was which was eventually taken by Corey Stahl, who's a or initially was a theater is a, who I knew from theater, and then um, I had worked as an associate with A.V. Kaufman, and we cast him in the feature film Salt. So I knew you know I knew him, I knew his work, and he was right at that time. And this is a lot of it is timing. Uh, he was right at that time where he had done supporting roles. He hadn't done House of Games yet, or House of, House of Cards yet. House of Cards. Um, he hadn't done that yet, um, but he'd done role, supporting roles in Salt and things like that. And 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 I just knew he was he would be great for this role. So it was getting him at that moment where he was looking for a lead, and you know this was an this was a director whose previous film. Um, start other actors that he knew. Um, in the first film I, that I, uh, the second film I worked on for Noah, The Missing Person, had Michael Shannon in it. So it was a lot of guys like that, that that these actors know one another and they can talk to one another about the director, about the films, and that kind of thing. So it's a word of mouth thing, and Noah really liked likes that, likes casting that way. Um, and so Corey came on board. And Marin was on board since she had worked with Noah on on the previous film, uh, and in that way we were able to, fl you know, uh, we actually used several actors that we that I put in the missing person, such as Yul Vasquez, um, and uh, now I'm blanking on who's in the cast. Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, so. You know, so the, so it's just a sort of a recap of some of those actors, and 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 he's so you know great about about being open to meeting new actors. So initially, when we were auditioning, there's a role of a young boxer, and you know I brought in Corey Hawkins for that. That is one of the roles that we did that we did do sessions for. And at the time, I brought in Corey Hawkins. And this is before Straight Outta Compton hit. So um, he was a teeny bit, you know, he's, you know, Corey, mid-20s. The role was really looking for a 19-year-old. Um, so not too big of a span, but in some ways that difference makes a difference. And um, 
and we ended up going with a with a, you know, a younger actor for that role, and who, who did a lovely job, Malcolm Xavier, and there was one role that they decided ultimately, as Liz said earlier, things keep changing, you know, and producers decide, well, we do need a name, you know, we do need somebody well known. So there's this one role of an older, of a, of a who was written as older. Um, initially, and he's the the nemesis to the Corey Stahl character, and uh, so we had to go through names and go through names. So eventually we came to Billy Crudup, who it turned out Yul Vasquez is very close with. So we put the offer out through the agent, and this is a low budget film, you know, uh, and this was just at a million dollars. So. We didn't have money to throw to the actors. A lot of the agents think that there's a secret stash of money. You know, even if you're working on the oh, ultra yeah. low, you know, they feel like there's a secret stash of you know millions that we're hiding or that we can just easily dole out. And sadly, it's not true. And um, and they are surprised, you know, that that's the case. So anyway, um, so we didn't have you know it was all scale for everybody. Uh, and so even though we were going through the proper channels, going through the agents, making those connections, we needed Yule's help to really talk, connect to Billy personally. And Yule ended up, you know, having an executive producer credit on that film. And so that's, you know, that's interesting, you know, just as a network of, of actors and their relationships and what, what they bring to, to the film beyond just performing, you know. Uh, and it's that kind of commitment that you'll get on smaller films, you know, uh, versus the bigger bigger studio films. Um, and in I've been working mainly with those budget films, so it's great, you know, it's great to have that kind of personal input, because uh, you're, even if it's not me directly talking to Billy Crudup, you know, I'm, I'm talking with Yule about talking to Billy, so it's that kind of work, and, um, and you know, and so we develop those kind of strong relationships with the actors because of their help on things like that. And that's that's sort of how the process went for that film. Yeah. Oh, this is so great because it, um, there's just a level of artistry that's involved, and then there's also the technical aspects of everything and how you put everything together. But it's like that heart feel towards something that you're just like you're willing to do whatever it's going to take to get this done and and it sounds like it's because of relationships that you have um I, I think it's interesting too all three of you have several hats that you wear in in the industry um and paul uh, if you want to talk could you talk a little bit about your work as a casting director and also as a theater director yeah i mean i don't do it that i don't direct theater that m much. Um, I got into it really through the Atlantic Theater Company and their school um, with NYU. And call me insane that I, I really love doing that at the college level for whatever reason. Uh, it's just a great, it's interesting to work with younger actors um, on, you know, it's not new material. I mean, I'm not, you know, I don't have a full-time hat as a director. It's sort of like when I can and when something really interests me. So it's sort of, you know, the stuff I've done with NYU is classic, you know, American play, like Arthur Miller and Lane Hellman, things like that. I did one new play at, at an off-Broadway setting, but that's, it's sort of a, like an avocational, you know, second thing when I can sort of figure it out. But um, it, it has helped immensely, I didn't know what was going to happen. It helped a lot in the audition room. Just, you know, the, it helped both ways, I think. You know, all I do is talk to actors all day in session, so it helped with working with actors on stage, particularly with younger actors who are still getting their BFAs and still learning things that you have to phrase in a certain way because they're not quite there yet, just, you know, in terms of their development and their age. And then in the audition room, it like, helps you think like an actor because in the audition room, and I do everything on camera, you don't have that... Uh, you know, there's not, you don't have that time like you do in a rehearsal for a play where actors, you can really like start, you know, getting into a character and talking, you know, for like an hour and a half about. So it was, it helped to get, develop that shorthand a little bit. 
Well, it was interesting too, Lois, because you were talking about how one actor will know another actor and bring them aboard. And that level of trust that people have with each other, I think m probably helps to move things forward as opposed to having to go through the pro, hello, I am so-and-so, you know, just so you can create quickly or more quickly a relationship that's believable um, on screen, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, and um, you know, that's what I meant earlier you, with the word of mouth of it all. Mm -hmm. You know, Noah became very close with Yule Vasquez after the missing person. And, um, and so, you know, he just would always go to him for recommendations or mm -hmm. do I know this one or that one? And, you know, he just, I know the kind of actor he gravitates to. So some other character actors that we had in the film include John Douglas Thompson, who's, you know, so so wonderful, doesn't really do too much film and TV, you know, because he's, he's lighting up the stage. So amazingly, but um, but it was great to have him. It was a real coup. And, um, and you know, we, um, we had other actors like Michael Chernus and, David Johansson and you know just these kind of great character actors everybody's different and everybody's very New York and it was a New York story so um, so that was important to Noah and in some ways each of the actors were able to to if they didn't know each other already you know they made that connection and on set and so that was great I love it Thanks. yeah and for you, Liz, um, you want to talk a little bit about, about being both, about being a producer and about being a casting director, because I know for Lois that you are as well, and how that works for you, and how much time you spend, you know, <laughs> wearing both hats, and if it makes a difference to you to take a project, because you're, oh, I, I'll be a producer on this, and the casting director, how, how you go about choosing your projects that way. It's always about the script and the people. I don't even ask about the budget until after I've read the script because I can't tell you how many times I will read something that um, I just don't think that um, it's going to be a, a positive experience for uh, myself or the actors involved. I, I sadly turned down an off-Broadway play because it was just so riddled with no point of uh, the privilege that was infused in it. And um, it was written. It was written by. It was written by a guy who works on Wall Street, who thinks he's a playwright. And um, put it this way: when the producer said, "Who's a good friend of mine," but that don't matter. When the producer said, um, "No, I love him," but you know, he said, "Well, if it doesn't work out, we can take our name off of it." Now that's okay because look, if he wants to make he he's going to GM the show and make his money. Go ahead, get your money. Uh, I'm all for that. I'd rather make money uh, doing other things, um, teaching, et cetera, which, which I do quite a bit of. Um, and um, in terms of the producing component, if I'm producing it, that means I'm casting it. So if, and I have been approached to produce, but they already have a casting director in place, and I'm sure you guys would agree, it would just hurt too much for me to, to be on the sidelines like not having access to my people and giving my suggestions and, and getting all in there. So if I'm casting a project but I don't have any involvement as a producer, it could be a Robin Hood project. Now what I mean by that, it's, it could be an industrial or something that, that's paying the actors decently, paying myself decently because in my world I work below rate like all day every day. And I say that I'm like the emergency room nurse, like with my clipboard, okay, what's your insurance? Let's just check boxes. So I am gravitated by the script, by the people, by the collaborative process. Uh, nine times out of 10, it's uh, people I've worked with before or referral. And those projects have been um, so satisfying. Uh, collaboration, I'm all about that. And um, for the, uh, just casting without producing, um, even if I've seen it before, if it's good, like I, I saw this before, but that's okay. It's your version of me, what I saw already before, but I will do a really great job and support your project and support your, your vision. And it's wonderful to just feel confident enough at this stage of the game to say no, 
to know that every no will lead to a yes. Um, that is more personally rewarding to stand by. Uh, common sense, not even principles, it's just common sense. You know, give me some good writing and have opportunities for what I see reflected in my world, which is uh, very interesting and colorful and multidimensional and not so cookie cutter. And um, how the producing came about was, I think from living in New York my whole life and um, during the economic downturn, presenting myself in a more valuable light where I was just like, oh, I know this person who's a great DP and I know that, that this girl, she's my friend, she does amazing makeup and all of a sudden, we're like, oh, well, let's get you on board as an associate producer. This is like eight years ago. Um, and we'll actually you know, give you that, uh, a little bit more of your rate for this and all of that. So I became a hybrid where, from the producing side, I was a better deal because you had two jobs for, not so much for, for the price of one, for, uh, for a rate that worked for both parties. And I fi find that I'm very passionate about it. I, I love creating. I don't want to really be the help, you know. Uh, sometimes I've worked on projects where, I, as just a casting person, where I was like a glorified getting coffee and, you know, we're the hot girls. And I don't want to do that anymore. So I'd rather help to tell stories that I feel deserve to be told. So that's it. So we've been talking about how you find your delicious, wonderful, character beautiful New York actors. Um, let's talk a little bit more specifically. How do you find, OK, there are people that, of course, have a lot of visibility in the business. Um, and then all these wonderful, delicious roles that you're casting. Um, how do you find your New York actors? Um, well, I, uh, hmm, it's really through, you know, through auditions. I mean, I don't, for someone who I'm trying, you know, to direct theater, I mean, I don't get to the theater that much. And when I do, it's like, you know, there's lots of, um, I don't know, there's like a political side to it, like someone calls from a big agency, can you go see this person, and da, da, da. I'm not complaining, I mean, it's, you know, but it's hard to go to like, you know, the Producers Club or the, uh, every Fringe show, which is impossible because there's only 4,000 of them and all that stuff, to see. So I like to bring in, you know, yeah, I think we all have, you know, and probably very overlapping sort of pools of, you know, X number of people, but I, I like bringing in people for, um, who, whom I, you know, whom I don't know, who I read about. I mean, I read tons of reviews, and so I can pretend like I saw your play. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I, I watch a lot of stuff on TV. So I, I just try to, like, and one of the things I try to do with, with, with NYU and the Atlantic is it's so hard. I mean, this is maybe too, too inside baseball, but we're all inside baseball. Um, you know, going to the university uh, showcases, a lot of those kids are already picked, you know, agents already have their eyes on them. So I, with NYU, I get to them a little earlier. And if, they're, if I don't have something for them in a the movie, I bring them in as used as readers, and then a director meets them. I tip an agent off to, you know, I directed this girl at NYU. Da, da, da. So there's a whole bunch of different ways to find people. I mean, I watch a lot of stuff that films in New York, and I just, you know, it, it's really, um, you know, I don't, you don't want to begrudge anybody working all the time, of course, but I do think that um, just as a, not just as a, you know, average viewer, I guess, but like so as a viewer who works in the field, I, a lot of New York shows, like I tend, I keep seeing the same people, some of whom are friends of mine, and I'm, you know, God bless that everyone's working, but I'm like, oh, there's, I'm not going to use a name, but there's so-and-so, again, you know, playing that corrupt lawyer or something, you, you know, so I like, and I like to watch a lot of stuff that's, that's streaming or that's web only or you know on some bizarre channel that I didn't even know I get on basic cable just because I you know there's so much out there um, it, it just gives you more opportunities to see people so and the other thing too is that I think it's hard for actors to think this way but I think of like you were talking about having sessions for roles that ended up being cast with names you know it's like it's hard for actors to think of every audition you go on as like a, as like money in the bank because you're you know, you want to get that job for that thing, but the numbers are so, you know, what they are. You all know what they are. I like to think of, uh, thinking of it as a, as a bank deposit, right, and Schnee Trust or whatever. And then, you know, I remember 
certain, I remember auditions that you know, maybe you weren't right or but you, something happened and clicked and I just liked you. People, I've brought people back months, years later sometimes. You know, I'll remember, or who was that guy who came in did that really funny thing with that? Right, and then I bring him for something else. So, you know, you don't know, I, I'm working on a gazillion things and maybe one of them is three years away or two months away and, you know, maybe it's not that one that you come in for, but and I know it's hard to think this way, but, you know, I got other stuff going on, these guys have other stuff going on. It's, you know, it's not just, yes, you're auditioning for that one show, whatever, or TV show or movie, but you're kind of auditioning for me, like, Broadly, also, especially if I don't, you know, we don't know each other, and then you just want to keep coming back, and I know it's disheartening, and uh, you know, to come back like for three straight years and not book something, but I don't know. I don't have anything. For, <laughs> I don't well, have a good note to leave that on, other than uh, it's the passion. I mean, yeah. every everybody yeah. here is doing this and is in it to win it, and I love that phrase, "money in the bank," because um, it's like you were seen, you were acknowledged somebody really got a sense of you and you don't know where that's going to lead. So it, I, it's lovely hearing yeah, that. You just you know? never, you never ever know. And yeah. in a way, like if I'm doing, uh, like we're doing this show for Amazon right now and you come in for a day play role for that, well you know that, you know, hopefully I'll be doing Tom McCarthy's next movie and hopefully the ones after that. And that's another reason to come in as, as much as that one, you know, Amazon show we're doing or something. So it's a little bit of a wider, what, like you're coming in for a bigger, a bigger thing, I guess. I don't know. Does that make sense? Great. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. It, yeah. it makes perfect sense, and I'm so glad that you said that because I think the baseline is who do we remember in whatever context that might be. So it might be that you came in for a play that I cast two years ago, and I remember, oh, my God, you got a call back, but it didn't work out with the director, whatever, but you're so perfect for, for this film. So I think it's memory retention. Um, you guys make such an impact on us that I think you, you're not even aware of, just in terms of how you say hello to us when you walk in the room, to uh, whatever you did with with the um, session, um, running into you at the fringe, whatever that may be. But um, I think a lot of what Paul had said, um, if we we meet through um, the foundation, I've been doing monthly monologue workshops with through the foundation for. Uh, this would be my 10th year, and I brought, that's a great way to, it's a pre-screen, and I tell every, maybe some of you have even uh, gone to some of my workshops, I say this before um, everyone, that this is not an audition, this is a pre-screen, because I'm going to get what I need, and I get the benefit of just getting to know you as a peer, as somebody in the same room that I'm in, we're breathing the same air. And that's been very helpful. Uh, showcases when I can get to them. I love seeing weird kinds of uh, crazy Bushwick downtown bed the wherever. You know, the, the bed when before it turned into bed like Billy Holiday Theater bed from back in the day, like, you know, when nobody else would go to bed but me. Um, but now everybody goes. So there's lots of great places. Uh, to uh, meet talent, so we'll remember you, whatever the context is, and um, also, like Paul had said too, just from the audition process, and we might be intrigued. You know, we have a lot of relationships. It's a tiny business, so I might be friends with a, an agent or a manager that implores me and knows what type of work that I do, implores me to take a shot on this person that they met at a, a university showcase, and if they're in that sort of context and I have a good relationship with the representative, I will bring that person in based on the strength of, of the pitch of that uh, agent or manager too. So there's, you just don't know, but we, we remember you, I think, more than you guys think we do. I'd like to encourage you to, to be aware of that. Love it. Thank you. And Lois, for you? I mean, that's so true. You know, you come in the room and you've made your choice and you do your audition and just because you didn't get that role doesn't mean it was a bad audition. It's so many other reasons, you know, unfortunately, go into the ultimate decisions, whether it's a mandate or somebody didn't have a cup of coffee before you audition. Uh, you know, but not only do we, you know, you know, go to theater and watch reels and listen to our agent and manager friends, but, you know, we talk to one another, too. And so that's another reason, you know, to, you know, even if I haven't met you yet, I might have talked about you with a colleague. And, 
you know, uh, so that that's something, that's a way that we're always sort of just keeping on top of who's out there, who's working, who's looking, who's, uh, who's, who's doing this kind of work or that kind of work. And, you know, so, you know, that's something that's always a process that's always ongoing and um, in a great way to just keep on top of who, who to see and how to keep expanding that network of, of actors that we know. You know, as Paul said, you know, I love auditioning and, you know, one of the films I worked on right before the Christmas break was a teen film, you know. So the teenagers, you, you do have to audition them, you know, pretty much, all, you know, if you're casting a teen film, you, you have to audition that group. There's very few, you know, they change so, you know, they're changing so quickly and there's very few names. So uh, luckily, you know, that's an exciting group to audition um, and... And the teens always need parents. So, you know, so that's always great to sort of put that together. Um, but it's all sort of a work in progress. And, and it's great to, you know, have you come in and do your best shot at it and, you know, know that you're, you're kept in mind. We keep our notes. We keep, you know, we remember way more than we forget. Great. The things that you don't want to be, don't want to be remembered for in terms of, like, stuck in someone's memory bank are pretty self-evident, right? Yeah. Well, do you have a few <laughs> things that you want to make sure that well, people I mean, don't like, do? Well, I mean, like, Lois just said, you know, when you come in and made your choice. I mean, there's obvious behavioral things, right? You don't want to be unprofessional or mean or, you know, whatever. I mean, you come in and, like, you're not polite to my assistant. I mean, he may be my, you know, he may be running Paramount someday and my, my boss. So you just don't, never underestimate how small this world is. Because if you get a, if you get a, a it's just as easy to get a, reputation might be a strong word, but, you know, we know who's a pain in the ass. Like, we all know. Even if I don't talk to Lois for a year, and I say, oh, hey, you know who I brought in? And she's like, oh, my God. You know, that goes quickly, as does, you know, someone like Corey Stoll, who we all kind of knew who Corey was for a long time, and then he pops in House of Cards, and I don't know about you, but I watched, and I was like, oh, you know, thank you, finally, for noticing someone. I, anyway, to answer your question, I mean, a pet peeve question, basically. Well, sure, why um, not? You know, what Lois One said about out, making yeah. a choice, I mean, I feel sort of depressed when someone comes in and I always say, and this is just me, I'm, I always say, do you have, you know, do you have any questions? I, every audition I say that, by which I mean, well, do you have any questions? You know, is there anything <laughs> unclear, whether you're coming in for a lead just for me, a pre-screen, pre or like a, you know, a, 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 a day player with a couple lines or whatever, just, is there anything in the sides that you don't get? Can I help clarify anything that will help you? And, and there's, for me, um, the objective questions that I think are fair game. Like, if you just get the sides that morning and it's like, I don't know, you're a maitre d' in some restaurant and you need to know, is this, you know, um, per se or am I a diner? Or what, what is this? If that matters, you know, great. But then uh, subjective things that are more like in your realm of character choice, I don't, you know, I have my own opinion, but I don't really, there's no right answer. And that's your job. So when someone comes in and is, it just makes me nuts. When someone comes in and is like, I say, do you have any questions? And they say, you know, yeah, this um, this Willie Loman guy. So is he like kind of down or something? I'm just, <laughs> you know, it's ha does this, you know, this Hamlet? Does he like what? What does he want? Does he want to commit suicide? I'm not sure. You know, these questions. I'm like, I well, I don't. You know, I. That's your. You tell me. That's why you're there to show us what you've chosen that yeah. that day. I mean, it, it have. I, I think with the combination of usually getting the whole script, not always, um, you should be able to infer, I really think, I really, really do, with all the stuff now we get like um, Project Hunter Secret and they, they create false sides, you know. If you're going in, for, like we did the first season of Jessica Jones, right, for Marvel, it's a comic book, it's a pre-existing thing, Daredevil's already on the air, I mean, they're very different shows, but you can get context enough yeah. that you should be able to make some, I, I, I find it hard to believe that someone's completely like in the dark when they come in. Like there's enough, uh, I mean, I have an 11-year-old daughter. She could find it all for you in three seconds. And so I know that actors can too. So I, I just think, even when they say, well, I just got the, you know, I didn't get the whole script, I just got the sides. I think there's enough, I don't know. I'm hard pressed to think of a time where you really, really will be out to, lunch, out to see and out to lunch just by getting sides. You know, I think it's, we did a film with Whit Stillman, for example, called Damsels in Distress. And he hadn't made a movie for 20 years, but all three of his previous films were on you know, available, he, no one else writes like he writes. You could tell that from his sides. He had pulled sides out of the script just for audition, so there was no, you couldn't tell the scene before and the scene after, you know, you get that, you can like look through the crossouts. 
but you could look up all his stuff and get a sense in a minute and a half without even having to watch a full film of his, how he writes and what his stuff kind of should sound like if you're coming in for him. So it's all, kind of, it's all doable. And even if you come in and have done research that, you know, I personally would rather see something that's clear and that I understand what choice you've made than just kind of as like, I don't understand what you're, if you don't know what you're trying to, it's going to be totally clear to me and even more so to the camera on the monitor. I, could, I get it like this too because you know, everyone's watching QuickTime files that might be this big, so I like to see faces and it'll be in your eyes, believe me. <laughs> it's like, that guy has no idea what he's talking about. So, you know, it's um, that lack of choice, which I guess is a way of saying lack of preparation, just really, I'm not really sure there's any excuse for it. Um, I don't mean to sound harsh. I just think it's, you know, make something up. I mean, just go. Because I, I feel like uh, it's easier to adjust someone in the room if they're like way over here, but it's totally clear what they're doing, but it's just not quite there, not quite it. At least I know what you're doing, and I can say, oh, I, you were doing, uh, wait, waiter was having a bad, I don't know, whatever, it was totally clear. Let's, let's move over here and do it like this. You know, it's, it's hard to adjust someone from like this nether world of nothing where there's no choice made because I haven't seen you make a choice in that first take, so, you know, I don't know. I could not agree with you more. <laughs> for real, for real, for real, because there's nothing more unappealing than a lazy actor or an actor that's not putting the, the work into it. And well, no, no, no. But let me let me clarify. I'm not throwing shade because this is real. So what what I mean by that is I think there is a, a growing population, and I w would love to know what you guys think of. Maybe it's because of the onslaught of reality content. And uh, look, I like me some housewives, so I'm not going to be a hypocrite. But my point is that I think there is a school of thought, well, if I look the part and I read, that's my preparation, which makes it really sad for and uh, frustrating for us. And um, it's an unfair representation of uh, you guys. So not knowing about the, the craft of film, the craft of, of theater, making intelligent uh, choices. I think that that's part of it, lack of preparation. There's absolutely no, uh, no reason for it. And just one little behavior thing, I'm not traumatized anymore, but um, somebody, came <laughs> somebody came in for me and um, the choice was to actually pull a real knife at, yeah, and pull it out and direct it to me. No, I was not reading with the person. The person just decided to do a dream ballet in the middle of the audition. So we're like, thank you so much. We called the union and um, then I, we had a couple of messages, and I swear to God, this really could be a movie. Liz, I'm so disappointed. Click. Liz, I'm so That's a movie, kids. Yeah. This sounds like a movie. Yeah, this yeah. sounds like yeah, a yeah, yeah. scary, scary movie. Scary, scary. So, like, you know, uh, don't use props. And um, just just make choice. It's really simple, you know, and, and you don't really need, uh, you could do your basic research, whatever's out there. Um, Google is amazing for that, looking at um, work that exists in this style or whatever, or just character choices. This person has a backstory, you know, who, what, where, and why. Even if you just did, did the five W's, and you either, and how do you feel about the obstacle that you need to overcome? Because there's always an obstacle. So I think it's pretty, I think it's, I think it's pretty basic. So. Lois, do you have anything to add? Well, just that, you know, the, you forget sometimes because it's work, maybe going to auditions and whatnot, but it's a chance for you to use your imagination and for you to share it with us, and we want to see that. And, and that's part of what makes it exciting for us, and I imagine what it make, makes it exciting for you. And so just keeping it on that kind of just basic level of show me your imagination, show me. And uh, and that's the exciting thing. You get to act for yeah. nine minutes yeah. or 30 seconds. You get your <laughs> chance to act that, you know. What about, um, because self-tapes are such a part of things yeah. now, do you have any suggestions for that? Like, what really works? And another question is, have you ever had somebody have to audition on Skype? 
have you ever had to use it? So anyway, I, what I'm thinking is like with this self-submission and the Skype, are there things that you've seen that really work that you'd like to mention that might be helpful to people? I gotta tell you this. I had to, uh, I'm not a fan of the whole trend now with the self-submitting and all of that because as Paul had described his process, like, oh, you made this choice. Okay, I, I, I get that, but let's go this. All of a sudden, that opportunity for any of us in the room doesn't exist. So I always lobby for doing a session um, in the room. I think uh, appreciating uh, the theater tradition, um, I just want to do that as much as I can. But one project we had to do through uh, submissions. So a couple, a couple people, uh, a couple actors had um, complained about uh, their their scene partner. Uh, you know, not being able to show up or whatever. And one one person, uh, so uh, so one person had uh, complained the person couldn't show up because they got a job or something. So she would just say her line and then pause and like wait until in her head the her scene partner's lines was done. And then somebody else had their friend deliver the other lines on speakerphone. <laughs> So you're saying these are things not to do. Do not do this. Well, I'm, yeah. that's why I'm not a fan. No, yeah, I'm yeah. saying don't do it. But, right. But these are these are things that wouldn't happen yeah. if you're coming in, in in into the room. And there's some really great articles out there about simple little things you can do, like you know, lighting yourself from the side, uh, you, the back. There are ways uh, to do it. Have somebody off camera that will be as supportive to read with you as one of the readers that I think we're pretty picky about who we have in the room to, to read with um, actors or auditioning, to mimic that experience as best as you can. I guess the advantage for you guys is you can do multiple takes, whereas we sort of miss that part of it because we don't know, that could have been, you could have done it 20 times and we got the 21st one, we don't know. Yeah, I agree with the, you try to get someone to read with you because it is weird when you know, there's just a pause, and I'm, it's almost like I'm like leading into the computer. Like, is there a reader? Is there someone there? Now, sometimes also people will record themselves reading the other lines and then play that back, and that I, I always am like looking for the ventriloquist technique. So I get it. I know if you're doing something, you know, you're you're filming or you're where, stuck somewhere with nobody, it happens. I mean, it's not. But I disagree a little bit. I would, you know, you can't always have a session, and I always. Uh, especially in television where the time gets a little more crunch, right. I'd rather have a self-tape than nothing. Oh, of um, course. You know, or, and I'd rather have a crappy self-tape than okay. nothing. Of Having course. said that, you know, I saw one the other day. It was done by a relatively well-known person on a, where she was shooting, and God bless her, she, you know, she, got, she got it lit. She had like two different actors reading with her for two different characters. The producer who we were working with, he was like, this, is, this self-tape is like better lit than my last three, movie, like three features. <laughs> it was an amazing self-tape, and it only made her look better. That's not to say go out and spend all kinds of money on equipment, but you know, I, you, I, you'd hope, I know I do, I can't speak for most directors or producers, but you'd hope that other professionals in our field would you know, cut you a break for not having it lit, and you know it's in your living room. I'd rather have something you do on your iPhone and at home with crappy lighting, just to, you know, just to see. And then you know, sometimes you can call and say, try it again this way, and then they email it to you, and it's, you know, I'd rather do that than like, you know, wait for you to fly back. Of course. Da, 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 da. So ideally, yeah, you're, yeah. you're in, in a perfect world, but that's it's not a perfect world. So we, yeah, and I totally agree. You can you can get enough for, of a pre-screen off of a iPad or a phone. Absolutely. Well, and also um, what I'm wondering about is, do you think that um, actors have uh, an idea of what you do that is just really not true, like you know that you're the decision makers, or that you don't have bosses that you need. Like when someone sends in a tape and it's not so great, you know that you would have to pass that on to the person that's bringing you into that project that you're working with. So do you think that there's like an idea that actors are like sometimes for you that well I can just um, get away with it or something like that? I mean, what do you think actors think? when they're doing something like that that's not up to par what do you what do you think are the misconceptions about what your position is maybe oh she was really nice to me at that sag event so it's going to be okay mm -hmm. and if it's not acceptable material i'm not going to i'm not going to send mm -hmm. it over i might 
I might contact the actor and say, you know what, it would be great if you, you can, by the end of the day, resubmit. Okay. I would do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the the maybe the most common misconception is that we're not on your side and we are. You know, we want you to give a great audition. We want to make it. You know, we want you to be one of the choices. We want, you know, we want you to knock our socks off, knock the producers and the director's socks off. So don't forget that. You know, we are on your side. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, you know, sometimes an actor comes in a room and has a defensiveness, perhaps, and wonder, you know, you wonder where that's from. And, you know, luckily... Uh, I always take the time to talk with an actor, work with an actor, but you know, you can read when somebody just wants to do the scene and walk out, you know, and that's fine too, as long as you're prepared, like we like we said earlier. But um, but the bottom line is to always remember that you know we're on your side and we do want you there and we do want you to do a great job. Called you in. Yeah. It's not like we're mm. taking you against our will, you know. So the, <laughs> the acting part should be the relatively easy part. I think it's uh. the job interview and the blind date aspects to what we do yeah. and what you do coming in that are maybe a little more, you know, prepare yourself as you would, I suppose, you know, for a job interview and a blind date because it's got components of both of those mm. things. That's and great. the acting part, that should be gravy. The rest of it, I think also so to some extent, maybe not with you all because you're you know, professional actors, but like with my mom, for example, like the degree, like the degree of decision making or power, or whatever that we have, is, it varies wildly from project to project. Mm. Thinking of us as HR is probably a healthy, you know, as like one mm. sort of thing to get through, I guess. Mm. And so, yeah, I mean, and there's lots of other factors. So I will push for somebody who doesn't audition well, maybe, had an off day, you know, if I know something about them and I know they, you know, had to put their cat down that the day before, let's not say that morning, but, you know, whatever the thing is, I, sorry, whatever the thing is, you know, I'll say, you know, look, here's her audition, it's a, she was having an off day, but watch this other material, and I get reels, I get demos all the time, I um, uh, save old auditions from other projects, take a look at this one from, you know, a year Ooh, ago, so nice. I try to like an HR person would, like present the whole portfolio. Yeah. Sadly, there's a you know um, st uh, corporate mentality, I guess, with studios where, uh, and this is happening now on, a t on this Amazon Amazon show. Um, sorry, for a show for a major streaming service, um, <laughs> where they're nervous that they're not seeing something in the ac actor's audition for that role, a very specific thing. And I say, well, this guy's got. 25 years of experience in television and film, and I've got clips, you know, out, <laughs> I've got clips a mile long of this guy showing him doing the th exact things that you're talking about. Well, yeah, but he's not doing it in the audition for this character. And I'm like, you know, you can't mm -hmm. sort of infer that that's the, and so you just remember that we only, you know, if you see a breakdown, this is a, it's a, it's a regular rule of, just a, a rule of thumb that, I don't know. Um, I suspect that, you know, you're doing a movie with Noah, you have a more of a shorthand communication with him than when you're doing a film for Universal. And there's 75 producers on the breakdown and 19 executive producers and it's for you know, NBC Studios and you know, ABC net, uh, Network or whatever. The, f the bigger the project looks, the further sort of removed we are from you know, the, what, the decision making process. If it's like I work with Deborah Granick who directed Winter's Bone, like, it's just me and her in a room and we talk and like, let's cast you know, Jennifer Lawrence, <laughs> you know, in that, in the case of that, but it's like, let's cast this person and that's it. And she doesn't have to ask anyone. So you can sort of tell when you look at a project, when you get a breakdown or an appointment, you know, if there's a hundred people on there and all these huge name producers, you know, it's an uphill battle for, for us too. So. And can, you brought up demo reels. Can you just talk um, just briefly about that, about what you think is effective, maybe the length of demo reel or how often you use them in terms of um, bringing somebody into the office? because of them? I think we probably all refer to them all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, 90 seconds, and have your best short clips, your best stuff at the top. After about after 20 seconds, I know if I want to see the rest of it. And I will see the rest of it. 20. Ooh. <laughs> but I'm the micro-budget indie girl, so it's, it's a difference. Is, this is maybe too technical, but when you get someone to cut your reel, be careful of and this may be just personal, but be careful of like, you know, the like montage of photos that float by and say like, Becky, and then like, 
you know, you'd be like, your bat mitzvah photo, but all, and it's to your favorite Joe Cocker song that you danced to at your wedding. Like, I, great, go right to your name, and then go right to your law and order, whatever your first thing is. All those futzy, you know, production thingies are, you know, don't let anybody sell you on. That, oh, this is what they want. They want to see, like, you know, your 10 different looks in the first five seconds. You know, nothing makes me, like, hit the fast forward thing fast. You know, I also just want to jump in, too, because you said law and order. Just because uh, you were in a scene on a very well-known show, but you're not doing too much, it's the main person that's doing a whole bunch, um, that's great that you have that credit. We're going to know that because it's going to be on your resume. I'd rather see the NYU thesis film that you were the lead in that showed some uh, raw emotion and, and range and viability than you were the waitress with the do pad, you know, saying you want more coffee. So it's great to have all those things, um, but especially the first um, zero to 20 seconds. Um, have something that's really going to um, engage us. Great, Melissa, do you have anything you want to add about that? I think those were the high points, yeah. Okay, <laughs> I love that. Um, you know, uh, as far as people, uh, actors getting boxed in with certain kinds of roles, um, do you ever feel as casting directors that you get boxed into certain types of projects that come to you? Maybe uh, I think micro budget indies, and um, I, this do, it, this actually doesn't bother me. I'm kind of glad that uh, that I get um, called for this. Micro budget indies that are extremely diverse and, and urban. So I, I like that. Mm. So that works for me. Yeah, happy with what you're doing, what you're I known need to for. Pitch in the title or perfect, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, after Winter's Bone, Carrie and I did get a little bit like, you know, the indie. Like Sundays, we now we don't have any movies at Sundance like for two or three years in a row. I mean, I guess it's a luxury problem that we're doing mm -hmm. lots of TV and stuff now, but yeah, yeah. I guess to some extent. Mm -hmm. Well, how might you suggest for actors that are say primarily working in one medium, wanting to jump over into something else? Um, do you have any suggestions for that? Let's say, I mean, a lot of New York actors are theater actors, so getting into like ways that they might get across your desk to be seen for. Um, the uh, you know they're theater actors that may be looking for work in television and work in film. Is there any are there any suggestions or things that you've seen that are successful to help cross over like that? Web series, um, webisodes. There are many success stories that that comes from that. Mm -hmm. um, there's a show called Teachers that just premiered on uh, TV Land. And that was a bunch of girls in it from Chicago that uh, they're all named Katie. And they're called the Katie Dids. And uh, executives at TV Land saw their three and four minute uh, web clips and flew them to LA and ordered 10 episodes and they're blowing up. So uh, putting your, just putting yourself out there, if you just want to um, understand the medium of film and independent film, as I touched on earlier, graduate thesis films. Um, is a great way. These are the filmmakers that they're they're filmmakers. They they are one step from getting out of school and taking advantage of all those resources and amenities that they're not going to have upon graduation. And there's a lot of viability um, in creating alliances, which is key uh, for all of us, and uh, doing good work. Wonderful. Well. Um, there was a question that came in, and thank you. Um, we've been gathering the questions, and I think that right now Melissa's um, getting any additional questions that she will uh, pick up for you. Um, but someone had asked about um, going to film festivals, that they'd been to Cannes, they'd been to Sundance, and you are seeing these wonderful films that are being made, but how to get involved in them from the beginning, feeling more like those festivals are about filmmakers. And Liz, you and I had talked about that earlier. Do you want to talk a little to that, like about getting involved when you're in those situations, when you're able to go to film festivals? Well, it is a celebration of the community of filmmakers. So that's the one thing to be aware of. There are so many opportunities to really learn at a deeper level the history of the film, the uh, creative team, there's often talkbacks. Whether it's Sundance or uh, any local film festival here, see a short of blocks. 
you know, have, I'm sorry, see a block of shorts. Ooh, see a block of shorts because you'll see uh, five or six very different short films and often there's a, a talk back. Even with the SAG Foundation short film showcase, which I've attended many, um, there's always an opportunity to meet the filmmakers afterwards. In a high profile festival like Sundance, um, approach, if you, if you dare to, pro to approach somebody, ap approach in a non-invasive way, the same way you might approach somebody that you might find interesting at a house party. So I think you have to uh, tread lightly, do your, do your research when you're there, know who you're talking to, don't pimp yourself out, but more it's celebrate the work and be, uh, present yourself as an asset, not a burden. Like, oh my God, this, per this actor is so much fun to hang out with and they're getting us drinks, let's go. Or whatever, whatever it is. Just be, be, be somebody that you just want to be around. No different than when you come into the room. Like, be happy to come into the audition, even if you have to act like you're glad to be there, as opposed to it's your worst day ever. Great. And we're part of that. Paul, do you have anything to add well, to I that? Yeah, I mean, if you go to, you know, all these film festivals now, I think, in one version or another, have 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 you know, like sidebars of, uh, like ultra low, like Sundance has the next. Is I think is it still called next? Like two hundred thousand dollars and under, and that's you know if you're going to go to Sundance for three or four days, which I, I, I don't wish wouldn't wish it on anyone, but you know, do what you want. You know that those are the filmmakers. You know, you, you don't want. I personally don't want to go to like the you know the CAA party because whatever. Yeah. But you know, go to the next movies or the two hundred thousand dollars ones, and like those have talkbacks, and go meet those directors, and you know start to get yourself around that way, and. Um, you know, just go and have fun and you know, try to make connections like that. I don't think you're gonna be able to go to like a, the, the big hot movie that's on IndieWire and everyone on everyone's like must see Sundance list and like get to go talk to that director. I, you know. Okay. Yeah. I mean, in here in New York, there's so many opportunities. There's so many smaller festivals. There's so many art houses or that have series that have panels. And, and, and as Liz was saying earlier, you know, it's about doing that research. So find out if you want to be an indie film, who are these indie filmmakers that you like? And, you know, chances are they're screening something somewhere and having a panel somewhere. And just being able to, to attend that and even if something doesn't come from it right at that moment, maybe three months from now you're going to reconnect and... I saw your talk. I saw your screening of that film, and that's a way to, you know, that's a that's a reason to go to f film festivals if if you should want to and have the time. Um, but it's also a reason, you know, just here in your in the city here, uh, go to these panels, go to these discussions, go to the screenings, and you know, a lot of them are free, you know, uh, downtown or or and uptown, so in Brooklyn, so so there's those kind of just pocket opportunities right here mm -hmm. to take advantage of weekly. Yeah. Well, and you've all been talking about projects that you've been attached to because maybe the person that um, you've worked with for a while, because you get them and they get you and there's a style or there's a feel about it that feels right. There's a connection there. So maybe it's also tuning into the kinds of projects and the people that are working on those kinds of things that you really want to be a part of instead of just, I just need to get work, I must get work, but to really like attach yourself because it's it's a lot of work to create a relationship. So you might as well be, you know, riding um, along in a, in a project or with a person that is something that excites you, that interests you, that really um, resonates for you. So maybe that's also a way of zeroing in. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, just picking up on that a little bit, like I get mail, you know, electronic or otherwise, that says something like, um, you know, hey, Paul, and I, that's somebody else I don't know, let's say. Uh, I'm, I saw you at the SAG thing, or I'm going to be on you know, The Good Wife. Uh, I'd love for you to have me in for something you think I might be right for. <laughs> and I'm looking at a postcard, I'm like, I have no idea who this person is. And I can look maybe at his picture and guess, you know, he, and if your thing is a still from The Good Wife where you're playing a gangster, then I'm gonna. Then what are you telling me that you're right? For? Do you know what I mean? So it's like I have no idea. You just have to be so specific in like self-submitting. Um, you see breakdowns. It's not that difficult. You know what kind of stuff we're working on. Like we, like I said, we were doing just to pick an example, the first season of Jessica Jones, right? 
I write a postcard. I love Marvel. I love Jessica Jones comics. I would love to come in for one of the, you know, Kilgraves thugs or something. You know, if you knew, if you know the world. But something that's like, it's basically, it's sort of like in the no choice realm of acting. Like if, in the old days when we had mail bins, you know, with, for actual hard copy letters, if I don't have a place to put it, it goes in the it goes in the garbage. If it's just like, hey, here's my new headshot. Well, I don't even know what your old headshot was. Unless, you know, we've had a discussion, like, you know, send me your new headshots and we'll talk about it. That's different, because I know you and, but, I, you know, it's difficult to, you know, I, it's, it's a touchy thing. Like, some people say, yes, send me a postcard for everything you're going to be. I don't, that's not, that's not for me. I like a very specific thing. I see you're doing this project, would love to be, you know, but um, we're doing a, a project now called The Interestings for Emma. Love the novel, would love to come in for one of the camp counselors. Yeah, I click, okay, when we get there, I'll, you know. But if it's just kind of like, hey, how's it going? Uh, you know, I don't know what to do with that with that mail. It's just a little, I mean, it's, you know, how much are stamps these days? So you don't waste. How much is a stamp? <laughs> <laughs> or like, you know, it's, just, it's a waste of your energy, I guess. Yeah. Um, here's a question that brings up the topic of diversity. Um, are there any new changes with casting actors with hearing disabilities? So I, I'd like this also to open up into um, the the question of, of diversity and non-traditional casting. I'm going to take that one. So um, again, diversity, inclusion, it's about um, the content. It's really about those stories. But what I would uh, suggest, let's say you see a description and you know that there is a way that you as a Actor, I like the word mixed abilities as well because we, we we are all jacked up in our own way, so it's mixed. Okay, we all got stuff. Um, that if you can find a way, a viable way, that you could play that role and to uh, and to state your case for that, um, that would be really interesting. So it would mean to maybe get some support. Um, there is an organization called. Uh, the Alliance for Inclusion um, in the Arts, formerly known as the Non-Traditional Casting Project, which I, uh, before I went out on my own, I did work uh, for them, and I think it sort of sparked the seed of inclusion in the late 90s. Uh, it was for actors of mixed abilities and actors of color. Now they just focus on actors of um, mixed abilities in uh, recent years. And I would ask for their support and advocacy to perhaps reach out to casting to say, we there's this actor, here's their picture and resume, they will bring their own ASL interpreter to show you how the viability of this role. So there are some creative ways, if it's not overtly in, in the story, there's this wonderful um, actor director named uh, Christopher Roberts, and he is visually impaired. And I wanted him to come in for this role that I knew he could he could play was a supporting role for a film and I didn't say anything to the director I just like to have sort of my wild card and Christopher uh, contacted me and he said I want to audition for the lead I said well then you make that happen then I'll go ahead and logistically I didn't know how he was going to do it and he's so brilliant he found a way using his cane and other bits of business, and he made it work. So if it's not overtly in the text, there are creative ways to go around it. There have been times where um, I have suggested um, a woman for a, a role that was written male. Um, there are the opportunities that we can make suggestions. Um, I, do it, I do it quite a bit. Um, actors that may be a wheelchair user or what have you, I will have a few interesting choices where it does work out. But at another level, I do implore the content creators to write for inclusivity as well. Awesome. We've got about five minutes left. I've got some juicy questions from the audience. Thank you, everyone, for submitting your questions. Um, one of them is social media. Do you look at actors' sites? Sometimes, if it's if uh, I mean yes, if it's if it's got extra material, like I usually look at demos for supporting materials for the audition you've already done. So if it's if you have a site and it's there and it's easy to 
to download and then upload to one of the casting sites that we use. I mean, yes, I mean, just randomly sort of surfing the internet, no. But if I see it on a resume, I mean, try to keep it updated too, because sometimes I'll see it on a resume, and I'll go, oh, great, I can find her demo reel. And then I go on the site, and it's like, you know, updated 2010 or something. And so, yeah, for me, I do. Yeah, yeah I just want to say, um, I cast a, a play last season for the Billy Holiday Theater, and it was a self-submission, but the actress um, had her commercial agent, although, and they're, uh, they're a big one, and they have a legit, but they were not interested, legit department, but they were not interested in helping me find this actress for this theater project because they don't cover her for that. And I dug, and I really want, I, I really wanted her to come in, and I dug, and I dug, and I dug, and I found her website. And through the contact interface on her website, I was able to hunt her down and bring her in, and she booked it. And it kind of changed her life a little bit. So she played opposite uh, Wendell Pierce. So it was life-changing for her. So yeah, have it updated and have it out there, because uh, sometimes maybe the agents, you know, in my world too, they're not going to make any money in my projects. You know, they'll get prestige because the projects do very well, but they're not thinking about that when they're dealing with overhead and making money um, for their clients. So have your website out there with contact information so we can find you. Great, and all these wonderful stories about casting directors fighting for actors, fighting to find them, fighting to have them do the role, wanting um, people to see them, that, that you are, uh, which is, here's a great question here, after you see someone's audition, where does the tape go? <laughs> I mean, it, it, well, yeah, tape is an, it's a quaint word. The quick, your quick time file, go, you know, <laughs> it depends. Uh, sometimes it, you know, one take, get, I, so I will tell people in the room, uh, okay, let's try one more time, I'm going to dump that last take. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't lie, I really will dump it. And let you, and hopefully that makes people feel okay about doing it again. I mean, most of the time it goes onto a, a, one of the, proprietary sites that we use either through Breakdown or Cast It or these different services that the studios or producers use to look at auditions. Um, where does it go? Uh, you know, I mean, it stays on our s own server or the server of the, of the service we're using. Um, I don't think that's what you mean, though. <laughs> I think, like... Yeah. So the question is... If the, if, yeah, if he yeah. gets the job, she said, if, if, if you book something... Right. Oh, yeah, if you get it, it's, you know, many, many more people than us have, have, have seen it. If it's just not... If it, you come in and, you know, you put one, you, you do an audition, and we, it's, we film it, and for whatever reason, it's like, yeah, there's nothing further for this person. Yeah, it doesn't go any further. It's not like... If, you're, if there's anything about, like, getting out there or something, that doesn't, that doesn't happen. If it's successful, well, then, yeah, then you'll sign it away, and it'll be on the DVD extras. <laughs> no, I know, okay. I know what you mean. Yes, if it's okay. successful, it, it has gone. Okay. You know, depends. It could be one producer, it could be six, it could be 50 people at a studio. It really depends on the size of the, of the project. Well, I just want to say that we really appreciate all the information that you three have given us tonight. Congratulations on your films that are being acknowledged. Um, the uh, Indie Spirits are, I believe, the 27th of February, yeah. so we'll all be looking forward to that. And um, it's also a great way to see, uh, you know, by taking a look at that, um, what other, you know, filmmakers that are out there, uh, what are they creating that you want to be a part of? So it's one more uh, opportunity to find out who are your people, who should you be working with. Um, but you three are all so informative and helpful, and we really, truly appreciate everything you did. So let's give them a big round of applause.